Hey. It's about seven o'clock. Sun is going to be going down over the next couple hours. Moving farther away, as the case may be. I was just going over some quick proofs with my roommate about how close the sun really is. We were talking about how is it possible to fool all the scientists, and I said, well, you have to look at the roots of science in a fairly illiterate cultures. Just like people believe all kinds of things in the Bible as though they're facts, um, because the abstract faculties of the mind are subject to a lot of suggestibility. Having left our land, having ostensibly given priests control and command of our land, our agency, our complicity, um, our industry. Um, so, just like they can write a Bible, they can write a scripture in the sky, make a Bible out of the sky, and make the earth a kind of Christ that people believe, even though we don't see anywhere near the parallax that we should, even though we can see things with optics a lot further away than the curve that NASA itself publishes could possibly allow for. Um, even though no matter what our altitude, the horizon is always flat and rises to meet the eyes, which is impossible. So just some quick thoughts. I don't have a lot of time and I don't have a lot of tape. So, Just like you can get people to believe a Bible, the idea that scientists... The idea that scientists couldn't all believe something is wrong is based on the assumption, poor assumption really, that because someone's a scientist they're immune to being suggestible on a religious level or the abstract levels of the mind, even though science is more abstract than most religions, especially today. They just, instead of the scripture in the Bible, they have a scripture in the sky, which is kind of like the abstract part of the mind. And the cybernetic algorithm provides for just as a drug user destroys parts of their brain to gain a kind of enlightenment, right? We fund a society where we help one another destroy our own brains or buildings on 9-11 in order to participate in a cult where our own self-destruction or the sacrifice of our native intelligence somehow makes us more enlightened even though it saves us from our own intelligence and codifies self-destruction. A self-destruction self or a social destruction or a 9-11 destruction that is finessed into saving technology. So that the same thing that blows up buildings and bombs countries somehow produces nuclear power and free energy devices. So there's a pathology, there's a mass psychology, there's, there's a perpetually negative cost-benefit ratio economics and psychology that starts with the scripture in the sky and a Christ-like ball earth that symbolizes a kind of death of our native sense of proportions that on some level we become convinced is the only way to save us from the presumed barbarity of our distant past or the twilight of human origins but the opposite is actually true we moved from a very bright, intelligent way of life to a very dark and dismal one. To a proportional degree, as with any drug addict, we become more convinced that the dismal is actually brighter than the bright. It's created a reversal in the very polarity of our minds. The sun itself then dies below the curve instead of simply moving farther away. goes into the underworld, much as functions of the human mind are sent into an under-functioning mode, so that we're more likely to extol to our children and one another and to excuse a monopoly upon our native industry and complicity and agency and our land. People fight. Every day I have conversations with people that work to justify why we should give property taxes. My psychologist friend laughed at me when I said that we re if we really honored property rights and all that meant in every dimension of the relationship between man and nature, we wouldn't need psychology. <laughs> and it is humorous, but it's true. Why don't we pursue these abstract regions of thought? 
Why are they just a source of humor? Is it because we recognize that we've lobotomized ourselves? That the prerequisite for making any kind of meaning with our words to one another in society is to forego our native tongue? Are we all slaves? I don't think it's a matter of, like Alex Jones would say, having the empire on the run. I don't think they've been nervous for hundreds of years. Why would they be? They totally control our land, industry, agency, and even our complicity. I mean, it's, a, it's an easy business to run. Our death is just a secondary fringe benefit. Depopulation is a, is a non-issue because the real death is the disorientation to life they have a monopoly on. Even our own complicity in it. Death is just the, the next logical step. I know that sounds like a dismal prospect, but isn't it better to see what we're really facing than to resort to fantasies and fallacies? I honestly believe that my brain is capable of making accurate determinations of the world and nature around me so as to get the best possible benefits in each progressively easier successive step of the vast inheritance God gave me, mitigating for the enormous suffering I am bound to experience because I have long lost my native coordination with life. It just feels appropriate as we watch the sun go down farther away. We enter the temple. Have a little Nutka rose. Welcome to my temple. Welcome to my school. Welcome to my living school. We eat some of the local herbs. We think. We reason. We, uh, we honor the fact that we've been greatly duped and disoriented. But we have occasion maybe to titter and laugh a little bit about it. Because we're capable of taking responsibility and being honest with ourselves. There's no doom we're going to face in the future. It's not about what's to come, it's about what we've become accustomed to. If you're thinking, you're bound to be a fly in the ointment at one time, time or another. Isn't this beautiful? I love thinking. I mean, I tell people I'm a writer, but I'm a thinker. I'm a real thinker. Because I say I am, but, but I am. I love thinking. I've been thinking since I was a little boy. I've been thinking all my life. I've uh, negotiated a nice place to live for, uh, for the interim, for some interim. I've uh, reacquainted myself with one of my family members, my, my mother, and hopefully build up a little more trust again. And I'm thankful for that. My roommate is happy. She's leaving her government job. She's about to embark upon a new life, sell her house. People around me are doing cool things. Talk to a man who's got property in the Queen Charlotte's, north coast of BC. Talks about building A-frame houses for $5,000, buying property for $19,000. Putting kinks in the system. Kinks that don't need to be kinks. At the end of the day, there's just a person that walks onto your land. At the end of the day, in all of our lives, this is it. This is, this is really the looming fear around us. There's a guy in a suit that walks onto the edge of our land. Let's say it's this land, right? 
And he comes with his ball earth religion. Maybe it's his Christianity. It's always cybernetics. Maybe he's got some drugs. Maybe he's got some foods that are really drugs. Medicine. All the same thing. All part of the cybernetic algorithm, right? And he walks onto the edge of our property and he waves. He's our friend. And he comes in his suit. It used to be robes. And he starts talking about really fantastical things. About if we sold a few of our trees maybe got some labor in, put the land to work, feed people in the world, all kinds of wonderful things. And then he leaves. And just like with Russell Brand talking to everyone, we titter. And some of us go, wow, he sounded really nice. He's nice looking, he sounds nice. And I say to them, he's full of shit. If he had anything worthwhile saying, he wouldn't be wearing that suit and he wouldn't have come to see us the way he did. He wouldn't be doing business on our land. He would have shown appreciation for what he was standing on. And he didn't the whole time he was here. The whole time he was here, he talked about something beyond our ken. He talked about being free and getting more and getting the system and making it work for you. But he didn't talk about the sufficiency we already have and how little we actually need. He was not conversant in the boundless value of this place. He was speaking a slave tongue, a church tongue, an occult tongue, a slippery tongue. He was speaking out of more than two sides of his mouth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. It has an all kind of inner consistency. It fits all together like parts on a sphere. And all those parts connect to stars in the sky, but it doesn't really make any sense because the earth isn't a ball. He was talking about a scripture in the sky, much as priests once upon a time talked about scriptures in a book. And instead of talking about a Christ, he talked about a ball earth and a global economy. He talked about a future riven with destruction, as though all the destruction we've seen based on his religion somehow can be finessed into our salvation. That human beings, once upon a time, were pushed off of their land by their own mistakes. Forced off by God forever. And that only by escalating those mistakes more and more, and consummating their death obsession with the murdering of a son of God, could they hope to have any salvation at all. It takes work, it takes labor, it takes sacrifice. Give us your children, he says. We'll teach them a trade. We'll make them useful to society. We'll give them good medicines. We'll show them smart books. We'll teach them with wise astronomers, spiritual thinkers with books, with names, with letters after their names. Bent letters, crooked letters. magical letters. And that day the sun didn't just move farther away in its circle across the physical plane of this earth. No, it went down a little bit. It sunk a little bit beneath the threshold of the human imagination. And we lost something of our cognitive function. If you cease to talk to your spouse, are they really your spouse? The church talks about a bride and a bridegroom, but if you don't talk to your land, is it your land? And if you don't talk, talk to your land and your life, is it your future? And if you're disoriented to life, are you alive? And whatever death or doom may be foisted atop of you at that point. It's not a doom that's in the future or to come. It's a doom that has to do with what you have become accustomed to and are more likely to find indispensable 
much as a drug that destroys parts of the brain, though giving you an opiate-like feeling of having increased your enlightenment becomes more and more indispensable. And if not a drug, any number of other drug-like things, beliefs, dogmas, religions. Historical sorcery and tragic historical events like 9-11 that somehow give rise to magical free energy that's going to save the world all the while surrounded by seeds with more intelligence than a single tiny seed, capable of producing all these trees for billions of years. And the vast economy of light from the infinite wells of the human soul, correspondence of the notes and scales of body and soul with the whole of cosmic life. The priests, the, the suits are still coming to our land and they're asking for property taxes. Property taxes. My friend said, well, that sounds good. It all goes to good things. But let's take an accounting, I said, of all that's being taxed. Our body, our soul, our children, our labor, our complicity, our industry, our agency. Because you can't do all the destruction in the world without destroying the brain enough of enough people to get them to fund that destruction as though their salvation from the life God gave them. That is the cybernetic algorithm, and that is a disease that knows no bounds in religion or, cre or creed or age, whether you're a new age or a truther or a conservative or a redneck, black, white, yellow, green, or purple. Whether you believe in the flat earth or not, the cybernetic algorithm, like alcoholism, eats everything. And the only way to learn from it is to accept that you have no control over it, to observe its enormous range of effects. It will eat relationship, it will eat love, it will eat reason, it will eat our lives, and no matter what we do, my roommate said, well, we're going to reach the hundredth monkey. Good will prevail. No, it won't. It's going to suck this world dry forever. Good has already prevailed. The life God gave us has already prevailed. The reason it's not prevailing in our lives is because of the cybernetic algorithm which relieves us of our agency and industry and monopolizes our agency and industry and complicity in our own self-destruction taken to project it onto various scales by the sorcerers of this world who can make a globe earth and stars billions of miles, miles away and black holes and big bangs for scientists that are just as enamored with the scripture of the sky as the priests of lore were enamored with the scriptures of the book, and with the Christ who went into the underworld, and now with the sun that goes into the underworld, or the drug that sends our cognitive function into the underworld to give us enlightenment, to give us the new world. Every successive dark age that we've been in for thousands of years we have to be honest with about the cybernetic algorithm. The putrefying, the putrid, endemic, pathological, developmental transmission as of any sexually transmitted disease of developmental psychosis and the cybernetic algorithm, which really are the same thing. Worked out in various economies of families, of biology, of pathology, of history, astronomy, agronomy, agronomy, physics, chemistry, all of these distorted religions and subjects that are really about sending man to hell forever and keeping him there. And they've been doing it well. They're in no danger of ending it. They're not on the run. The empire is not on the run. They're not nervous. And death is not something that they necessarily are seeking for the whole human race. It's just a fringe benefit side effect after they sucked the life right out of us. We can't control this virus like alcoholism and every other major disease in the world. The stress is the source of all disease, all inflammation in society, which causes aggression and neglect and ambivalence and apathy and fantasy. Magical thinking about free energy that's going to save us all, wrested from the thunder of Thor that took buildings down to the ground. And people will do any kind of mental gymnastics to make that happen. The kind of mental gymnastics you have to do 
to make it seem as though a school system provided by people who slaughtered the Native Americans somehow are interested in the welfare of your children. Most parents tell me they're extremely dissatisfied with the school system, but don't do anything. There's the empathy. There's the loss of agency. Making jokes and making justifications. When, though the problem is imposing, we sit on our God-given land. Right here. I will not go quietly into that quote-unquote good night. It's not good. And it's not any kind of night that the brain is supposed to implore itself to adopt. I don't implore the dimming of the human mind beyond the pale of the sun. It's not just about a flat earth. We can't control the virus that eats our lives and makes most of us smile about it or be philosophical about it. Nor am I talking about walking on the streets and walking up to Parliament. I'm running out of battery. We're in luck. I've spent most of my life dealing with alcoholism. You don't control it. You observe it. And then information, your own emotions, the feeling of being out of control, that you just should have known better, you don't know, because all that ignorance comes from the choices that we have made in terms of the way we live. Sacrificing our native intelligence to a drug or to a way of life that makes it seem like augmenting our thought with cybernetic technological augmentation is going to improve our thought instead of cost us all our thought, thereby losing the brain function to even make the appropriate determinations as to whether it's, this is a good idea or not. That's a religion, that's a cult, and these are all cults. This phone is a cult. I'm a cult member, you're a Bible salesman for the globe Earth. We're a Bible salesman for stars light years away. We all are, or we have been. And if not for that, then for something else. Technology is going to save us. Gene splicing is going to save us. Right? Illnesses are just here because that's it. The new age is here and the Aquarius age is here and things are just going to get better. I agree that new energies are always coming in, but it depends on what we do with it and gaining a reasonable apprehension of the scale of a problem and that we can't control it. That allows new information to come in. And I've spent my life having to do that. That's the only thing that qualifies me for anything. It certainly isn't my schooling, my reading, or literature. My primary research was dealing with people in all walks of life when I realized that not just my family, but the world, the clouds in the distance here, and the sun setting, right, is filled with psychopaths who honestly believe the earth is a ball. And they believe a lot of other things too. Because I changed my mind a lot before I learned the earth was flat. And believing that the earth is round changes a lot of things in the mind. But get to the core of any disease and any number of symptoms can be alleviated. I will not give any more of my complicity or agency or industry or land to anyone than I absolutely have to. The idea that property taxes are somehow a good idea is absolutely fucking ludicrous. The whole idea of a tax is ludicrous. This is not about tax farming. There's more than enough here for everyone. Should I live on my land or live the image of living on my land, which is a theorem that no priest has foisted upon me, but I am the priest of my life for? Not everything, but for my land, for certain, for certain. Can produce so much. We can produce energy and thought and critical reason and common sense approaches to the f true scale of suffering in this world. Images and stories about these suits that come onto our land, literally and figuratively, every day of our lives. So that we can awaken, so that the very... It is only alcoholism, it is only the pathology of the world that can in itself, that is the solution that can speak to our knowing better on behalf of our land. Sickness Speaks should have been the name of Eckhart Tolle's book, not Stillness, speak, stillness Speaks. Sickness Speaks. It's the only thing that is speaking to us. 
It's the thing we have most of right now, aside from the inheritance God gave us. Good will only prevail if we don't constrain that good to the opposite of all the bad things. Because life ultimately is the integration of all things. Psychopaths lie on the horizon. They're coming now from Rome. Nice people that want to talk about taxing our land. A man that talks about having his own land and then deferring his taxes to the government upon his death who can then take his land, sell it. His land. Your land isn't just for your lifetime. Your land is for eternity. That's the only land I've ever aspired to in my work, in my poetry, my philosophy. My land is for eternity. I'm here forever. Come back here in a million years and you're going to hear my thoughts drifting in the wind. These thoughts will be drifting in the wind and it will hit the ears of children a million years from now. The wind and the patter of rain and the twinkle of the stars and the movement of the clouds and the shade of the leaves and the moon and the sun and the call of birds. That is the language that I live for. And I don't apologize for it. I don't apologize for that intelligence that is fair to the intelligence of every man, woman, and child on earth. Attacked though I am by people who would insult the intelligence of every man, woman, and child on earth as though they're saving them from something. And that's the cybernetic algorithm at work. Every day, I'm not even kidding you. Every day. Nice people, bad people, stupid people. You know, we're not going to be saved by some other person. We're not going to be saved by Russell Brand or Alex Jones or David Icke or even Eric Dubé. We're not going to be saved by anyone. We're going to be saved by the life God gave us. And if you're not saved by the life and intelligence God gave you, you're never going to be saved. That's not a religion. That's a way of life. That's reason. That's living reason. That's the essence of logic. Make it your own. Make it your own. Learning about the flat earth changed my mind a lot, but it also underlined everything I'd ever learned about this life. Certainly about the, what we have made of this life. But I have to go now.